Hey there, and welcome to this brief, brief history, history of rubber. of rubber. Now I know what you're thinking. How exciting can the history of rubber actually be? Well, my friend, there's more to rubber's story than you may realize. Rubber's been around for a very long time. Thousands of years ago, the ancient peoples of Central America invented a game that used a rubber ball. Historians believe that teams of players would go back and forth trying to keep a ball in the air, much like volleyball, using nothing but their hips. Nothing like volleyball. Later variations of this game added the extra challenge of having players get the ball to go through a stone hoop mounted on the wall of the court. This was one tough game. As time passed, these people found other uses for rubber as well. For example, they learned that dipping your feet in rubber suddenly gave you shoes. And coating clothes in rubber made them resistant to water. As it turns out, the native peoples of Central America were not the only ones to be impressed with the uses of rubber. In 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed from Europe to the New World. This started a steady stream of explorers heading to this newly discovered continent. Let's get them, boys! <laughs> Quick to recognize a cool thing when they saw it, these explorers were fascinated by rubber and were eager to take some back with them to show their friends and families, and any members of royalty that might be interested in rewarding them for their efforts. With money, fame, power, you know, the usual stuff. Now there are stories to tell of the first European citizens to see this new material and how it could repel water. Rather than simply being amazed, they assumed the guy with the rubber-coated outfit was up to witchcraft. And well, let's just say that didn't go over so well. Witch! 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 However, people soon figured out that this was just a new substance they'd never seen. And before long, Europeans everywhere came to marvel over the many things rubber could do. Step right up and see the mystery material of the Amazon. It jiggles, it stretches, it bends, it bounces. Will it cure grandma's bunions? No, but it will make her feet more comfy. Ooh. Huh. Apparently you're not a witch. Pretty soon, factories started popping up and rubber goods became all the rage. Never the type to sit idly by, America soon was building its own factories and quickly became a giant in the world's rubber industry. One of the most famous men in the rubber industry was an American named Charles Goodyear. As one story goes, Mr. Goodyear had been experimenting with some rubber, and one day he accidentally burned some on a hot stove. The rubber's properties actually improved, and this inspired further experimentation. Soon, the process of vulcanization was born. The vulcanization process gives stability to natural rubber, which is normally sticky when warm and brittle when cold. Without this process, Think how the tires on your car would work if they got super sticky in the summertime and hard and brittle in the winter. Yuck. Thank you, Charles Goodyear. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Before cars were popular, rubber was in high demand, and that meant rubber could make people a lot of money. Unfortunately, this led to some of the greatest human rights violations in rubber's history. Enter King Leopold II of Belgium. Tiny country, average sized man with a huge thirst for money and power. In the late 19th century, Africa was being carved up by European countries looking to gain wealth and resources, and Leopold saw his own opportunity. I call it. Well aware of the value of rubber, he soon managed to gain control of what was named the Congo Free State, a territory 76 times larger than the size of his own country, and in which, it just so happened, a vast supply of rubber trees could be found. The king sent troops to force the native population into harvesting as much rubber as they could from the trees. However, in what can be described as blind ambition gone horribly wrong, Leopold's selfish and brutal pursuit of rubber resulted in the deaths of millions of natives, simply because he cared more about wealth than he did about people. It should be noted that Leopold was not alone in his pursuit of wealth and rubber, and sadly, his is but one example of abuse in what could be called rubber's darkest era. But rubber has had its lighter moments as well. In 1887, a father watched his young son ride a tricycle over rough cobblestone streets. The hard wheels made this adventure rather uncomfortable for the boy, as you might imagine. Ow. So his father, John Dunlop, inflated a rubber hose around the wheel, effectively inventing one of the first pneumatic tires. Hmm? Ah. 
The pneumatic tire would soon find other applications, first in the bicycle market, but ultimately where it would see its most prevalent use, cars. The automobile was invented in the late 19th century, and rubber soon became the material of choice for tires. This fine horseless carriage is quite the luxury, and these rubber tires, I like rubber. As the popularity of cars grew, so grew society's dependence on rubber. We need cars! We need rubber! By the early part of the 20th century, it was official. Rubber was no longer a luxury, but a necessity. And then World War II had to come along and mess with that. Cut off from sources of natural rubber because of the war, the race was on to create a synthetic rubber that could be produced at home. Before long, scientists came up with a substitute for natural rubber that worked pretty well. Oh yeah, we got rubber. High five. Synthetic rubber didn't have the exact properties of natural rubber, and therefore could never replace natural rubber, but it did all right for itself. Actually, more than all right. By the late 1950s, synthetic rubber production was catching up to that of natural rubber, and today, synthetic rubber accounts for approximately 60% of the world's rubber production totals. Rubber has become a necessary part of our society and is truly all around us. Not only is it used extensively in the automobile industry, in tires and dampening materials, but it is also found in medical equipment, construction materials, clothing, and, much like our ancient Mesoamerican friends, found in our sporting games as well. It's nice to see that some things never change. So there you have it. I hope you've enjoyed our little journey together through a brief history of rubber.